Yeah, so thank you all uh, for coming and thank you for the invitation, which came before coronavirus was even was even a thing. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's nice to be here, even though it's not in the real the real world. Um, coronavirus has largely interrupted my mathematical life. And so um, coming back online and being part of the conference and stuff has been great. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about ring learning with errors and rounding. And the idea is to introduce you to the problem so that you're familiar with what the problem is, and then to convince you two things. One, that there's some interesting number theory in the problem, in fact, and two, that we should try to cryptanalyze it. Um, so, oops. right, so I'm going to give a little bit of a history of lattice-based cryptography to start with. So, um, so this is my timeline here. Most timelines sort of start with Itai Dwork, uh, who proposed a public key crypto system. But around the same time, which you're probably more familiar with, is the Entru uh, crypto system, dates from around then. And um, not that much longer after that, learning with errors was introduced um, in a cryptographic concept, uh, um, context. And um, learning with errors has been uh, important for lattice-based cryptography because it's a particularly adaptable um, uh, uh, it's particularly adaptable for building cryptography. And so as an example, uh, a few years later, homomorphic um, encryption uh, was realized for the first time. And now um, homomorphic encryption is built with learning with errors. So these sorts of applications uh, have gotten people excited about using lattices for cryptography. Um, homomorphic encryption, if you're not familiar, is um, being able to uh, do up operations like addition and multiplication on the encrypted data. So the idea is that um, somebody who doesn't have access to the key can do the, the heavy lifting of adding and multiplying and whatnot and get the correct encrypted answer without ever having access to the actual data. Okay, so then after that, um, ring learning with errors and learning with rounding were introduced. Uh, and there's a, a sort of flurry of papers since then. So ring refers to adding to the lattice um, a structure from number theory. So in particular, what you're doing is you're actually taking the ring of integers in a number field um, or ideals in such and using that as your lattice. And again, of course, then there's the NIST post-quantum crypto competition, still ongoing. Um, here's AGCT from a couple of years ago. That's me repelling down a rock face after asking to go for a nice walk. And now here we are in 2021. All right. So, um, okay, so lattices. So lattice, I mean, it's a copy of Z to the N, but what's important for us is that we're gonna embed it in R N. So it's embedded in the space which has geometry. So R N has an inner product. So you've got things like a length and angles and so on and so forth. And when I give you a lattice, um, I can give it to you in, by, by listing the basis elements. That's essentially how I transfer the information of a lattice. And I could give you a good lattice or a bad lattice, right? So the green one here is what I'll call a good lattice and the, the red one is a, a bad lattice. And what I mean by that is that the green one is sort of concordant with the geometry of Rn in the sense that, so if I put the sun here at the origin, um, the, and I ask for something to do with the geometry in particular, if I ask for say the short vectors in the lattice, then I'm gonna get those by taking short, small linear combinations of the basis elements of the green lattice. Okay, so that'll generally, if I take small linear combinations, will correspond to short vectors. But for the red one, this is not at all true. Okay, um, okay. so N here, the dimension of the situation, that's the security parameter. That's what we're going to measure how hard the problem is uh, with respect to. And so this picture is very misleading because it's only two dimensions, but of course, it's hard to draw. So how could you turn um, this sort of observation about good and bad lattices into hard problems that you could use for crypto? So you can start with asking for, so basically you're giving a basis and then you're going to ask to access the geometry. So you could ask for the shortest vector in your lattice. Um, or you could ask for a vector within some factor alpha of being the shortest in the lattice. And then you can make the problem easier or harder by scaling alpha. And so in the picture here, say the red dot is maybe the origin, and then this is one of the shortest vectors in the lattice. Here. You can make it a decisional problem if you like. So you could 
pass people lattices and say, just differentiate between ones where we have a very short vector and ones where we, we maybe don't. So there's some gap there. Um, you can also talk about the closest vector problem. So if I give you an, uh, a point in Rn, I could ask for the closest lattice point to that point or a point within some fixed distance um, uh, that lives in the lattice. If I give you a guarantee, so I say that the distance I'm requiring you to look within is, uh, is such that there's a unique solution, then we call it bounded distance decoding like in coding theory. Um, and you can see here the, the dimension of the problem is what's protective because in high dimensional space, there are very many short vectors. There's very many directions to look. So this is actually too big to exhaustively search, right? Okay, so that's the sort of general overview of, of lattice problems. Um, now a little about how hard they are. So let's take the shortest vector problem, for example. They've got this, uh, this parameter alpha, which is um, what you're asking for. I'm asking for a vector within a factor alpha of being the shortest. Um, and you might ask for, as alpha changes, what's the runtime of available algorithms, right? So we can sort of, as axes, we can go from polynomial in n up to exponential in n in both parameters. Um, so if you take, if you require alpha equals one, that's asking for the single shortest vector, then the problem is NP hard. Um, but if you ask for a uh, polynomial in N, then that's the region where we're doing cryptography, okay? And in that region, then exponential time is essentially the best that you can do for this, this problem. But there's a sort of trade-off. And so um, LLL, which the lattice reduction algorithm, will get you a short vector in polynomial time, but the vector is only short in an exponential sense. So it's down here, LLL, and BKZ is sort of LLL expanded. And that gives this, um, this line here, which is sort of approximately just this trade-off. Um, okay, so that's uh, vector problems. Now, the, the thing is those problems as, uh, as proposed, um, they don't look very amenable to building cryptography. And that's where learning with errors has been so useful. So let's suppose, um, just to, to convince you that learning with errors before I state the problem is a sort of natural problem from the perspective of lattices because its statement doesn't look quite the same. Um, let's do this thought experiment. So suppose we wanted to solve bounded distance decoding. So that means that I'm given an X, which is not in the lattice, and I want to find an S which is in the lattice, but differs only by a small error E. That's the error in learning with errors in a moment. Okay. So suppose I wanted to do that. Then um, if we had some sort of moderate length vectors in the lattice, so say A, I could do a dot product of A with X. I'm given X and I have some A to use on it as a tool. Um, and I could compute that result. So what does this look like? So by the linear behavior of dot product, um, this is A dotted with S and then A dotted with E, but E was small, so this should be small if A wasn't chosen to be too large. And so now what this looks like is a linear equation, but with a kind of an error term. So if I just, if I covered up this part and just had A dot S equals B, that would be a linear equation in S. So it would be one piece of information that I could use to solve S. Um, but, okay, so here's what it would look like. Um, but it's not actually a linear equation because it's got this little error term, okay? So you come up with a series of linear equations, well, almost linear equations that you would like to use to solve for S. If there were no errors, you could use Gaussian elimination. Um, okay, so this is, the, this is the problem at core. So we're gonna fix some secret. Now um, we're working on a computer, we're gonna work in a, in a finite vector space. So let's do FQ to the N instead of R to the N here, okay? Um, and we're given a linear system that S approximately solves. So it looks like this. This is a matrix. There's my vector S. I have the output vector and some error. So I don't know B and E individually. I just know B plus E. And Gaussian elimination, if I tried to use that, would amplify those errors. It would completely fail to solve the problem because it's not stable in that sense. Okay. Um, and so we don't have... Uh, we don't have that. And it turns out that this seems to be a hard problem. So the way it's usually phrased is in terms of samples. So we think of each of these sort of almost linear equations as a sample. And it lives in FQ to the N cross FQ here. So then my vector A and then what I get 
when I dot it with an error packaged in, which we can't separate out. Okay, so we're just given these two coordinates. Um, we pick Q to be some prime, uh, N to be the dimension, some positive integer. Q and N together really form the security parameter because if I wanted to search the space, it's size Q to the N. And then E has to be chosen from some kind of error distribution, which means if I were to choose it uniformly, then of course this isn't going, I'm going to have no information by giving these approximate sales. They're not even going to be approximate, they're just garbage, right? So I have to have uh, <coughs> some appropriate notion of smallness for the error so that it's not so small that you could find it by guessing, but so that it's small enough so that it means something to have a bunch of samples like this. So to, to clarify that point, if I were to give you just one sample, you would not have a unique solution S because for each possible error, you could derive a, a perfectly good S solution to this. But if I gave, give you enough of these samples as sort of an overdetermined system, um, plenty of equations, then um, the requirement that E be small will lead to there being, if they're correctly formed, at most one possible solution S by, by chance. Okay. Um, and so it does form a sort of well-formed problem. The S can be determined in the abstract, but computationally, um, at least at first glance, you would have to search through all the possible short errors. And in high dimension, even a small box has too much stuff in it. Okay, so um, during the whole talk, you should stop. Uh, you should interrupt me with questions and stuff. I don't have the chat box showing. It's, um, I'm not sure where to put it. But are I'll there any questions? Kate if somebody says something. Okay, great. Yeah. So any questions right now? Uh, not yet. Okay. Okay, so that's the that's the basic idea with learning with errors. Um, oops. Okay, so what about this error? Uh, so usually people take a discretized Gaussian distribution on the lattice, which means that you take a Gaussian in high dimension over top of your lattice and use that to determine the probabilities of uh, sampling any particular vector if you use this distribution. Um, for sampling vectors. So the idea is that at the origin, you have a higher probability of sampling stuff. So it's kind of like a fuzzy ball around the origin is what I'm going to use for my errors. So short vectors in the lattice. Okay. All right. Um, so because of various efficiency considerations and so on, um, it was proposed to put a ring structure into the situation so that we have more structure to more symmetries, I should say, really, um, in the situation, which allows you to be much more efficient when you're building cryptography. So, uh, so here's a version of the problem where we're working over a ring. So let's take Q to be some prime. I'm giving you an idea about what the sizes are here. So the security in this situation is really the size of this, the vector space. So it's like Q to the power N. So that's plenty large, even though these two individually aren't. Um, and let's take the dimension to be a power of two. So what I'm actually gonna do for my vector space, it's not just gonna be a vector space, it's going to be the cyclotomic ring of integers. So I'm gonna take a two power primitive root of unity, zeta m, and I'm gonna build the ring of integers, which looks just like this. This is the cyclotomic polynomial for a two power um, uh, order root. Okay, so I could use a basis, which is built of the, um, uh, the powers of that primitive root. And um, so I can express elements of this as vectors of coefficients in terms of this basis, or the coefficients of x, if you think of it as polynomials, which is the same thing. Okay, so I've got this thing. It's it, the coefficients now are going to be over fq in a moment. So I'm going to do O mod q. Okay, and that's going to give me a finite. Uh, ring to take a look at. Now, from number theory, we know that ring, um, if we, we can look at the splitting of Q in the field, and that'll tell us by Chinese remainder theorem that this is some product of finite fields. OK, so this is the setting we're working in. And as a vector space, it looks like FQ to the n. And so um, we can do what we were doing a moment ago in this space. But we want to respect the ring structure, use the ring structure. And so what I'm going to do, um, you'll see in a second, is I'm going to use the multiplication in the ring. Okay, so first let me talk about the, um, the error distribution 
before I do that. Um, so like I said before, we want something which is like small short vectors around the origin. So we would again typically use a discretized Gaussian distribution. But in this context, you can feel free to imagine it like the short vectors in this world are the ones that have as coefficients in this basis of the powers of the primitive root, just zero, one, and minus one psi. Okay, and in high dimension, that's plenty of short vectors. So the coefficients are just independently chosen, zero, one, minus one. Um, so you can do various, various different things, and people do all kinds of different things. Um, but, uh, but that's a convenient one to think about and to implement. If you wanted to do um, another uh, number field instead, then the really the appropriate thing to do, which amounts to what I just described in this case, is to take the Minkowski embedding. So you take your ring of integers, use the Minkowski embedding to put it into Rn, and then you use short using the, the you know the usual inner product in Rn. Okay. And in the case of two power cyclotomics, they're very special. They have pretty much just um, a orthonormal or almost orthonormal basis um, in the Minkowski embedding. And so using the powers of the primitive root is basically using the nice sort of square basis in there. Okay. So these amount to basically the same thing in this case. Um, okay, so now we have the notion of an error. And so then what do our samples look like? Instead of doing a linear transformation or taking, you know, multiplying by a matrix to get linear equations, I'm going to multiply by an element of the ring. So my sample looks like an A, which I'll choose randomly from somewhere in the ring. And then I'm going to take A times S plus a little bit of an error. Okay, and that's what I'm going to give to you as B, the second part of the sample. S is the secret, E is short in the sense I just described. Okay, so I give you a bunch of these samples. So I just give you a bunch of ordered pairs of elements from the ring, and you have to determine what is S. Um, you can make this into a decisional problem if you like. So you could ask somebody to distinguish samples like this just from ones that are formed uniformly randomly in um, O mod Q cross O mod Q. And um, you can think of one of these samples. It really is an instance of the learning with errors problem that I described just in terms of linear algebra, because multiplying by A is a linear transformation. So this is just um, one of these samples. This thing has N coordinates to it. So this is actually N LWE samples. Okay. So one of these samples is N LWE samples, but they're connected in some way, right? There's a lot more there's number theory now this there's something going on they're not just randomly unrelated samples then um people actually interpolate between ring lwe and lwe by taking you know uh o mod q for maybe not as high a dimension so this is a little bit smaller but then taking some number of copies of it um, and they would call that module lwe okay so that's the problem so are there any questions about the problem before we start discussing how hard it is All right. OK, so um, we saw a search and decision version. And plenty of crypto is based on decision for its security. And so there are search to decision reductions. So the main proposal is to use this for cyclotomic fields and specifically power of two cyclotomic fields. Um, and so that's where search to decision reduction was proved first. Um, but you can extend such a thing to Galois fields. Um, so that means that you could try to attack really either of these problems uh, in most cases. All right, so there's all kinds of caveats in this. So I oversimplified to get access to the problem in an intuitive way here. Um, but basically, um, you know, when it was first proposed, it was proposed um, where the secret lives in, in the dual. Uh, and, but of course, the, the difference between the dual and the original ring is this... Um, this different ideal and its principle in many of the cases. And so you can scale to get from one to the other. It was proposed to use continuous error originally and then security reductions to this kind of error I'm describing, which is discrete. Um, other number fields um, from the perspective of computation and implementation, it's natural to think about polynomial LW, which just means taking Z to join X and modding out by some irreducible polynomial. So of course, then we're considering maybe non-maximal orders. And how does the prime Q behave? Um, it seems that people tend to like for implementations to choose a Q which is split um, as much as possible. But you, there's nothing wrong with the problem and for these various different setups. 
Okay, so um, so it's quite it's quite a web of tangled different versions of the problem, and there's security reductions between the different versions, and so on and so forth. So I've oversimplified, but now I'm going to continue to oversimplify. Um, okay, so why is it actually so useful? And it's because it looks kind of like discrete log, right? We're kind of a one trick pony. <laughs> and so um, in discrete log, you're given a G and a G to the X and you wanna find what is that X? What power did I take? Uh, or if you're on a elliptic curve, if you prefer, right? You're given a point and a multiple and you're asked what multiple? And here it looks kind of the same. You're given an A and an AS and you wanna find S, only that would be easy in this ring because you could divide by A. So instead we add this plus E, this randomness, which makes it a hard problem, okay? But it makes it formally look a little bit like the discrete log and that allows us to build um, cryptography in ways that we're familiar with. Um, it's also particularly powerful, I think, because it's linear algebra. Um, so there's, it's, I don't know. Okay, so, uh, so as a sort of proof of concept, um, here is how you could build a, a simple sort of toy public key crypto system with this problem. Uh, and it looks just like El Gamal. So if you're familiar with El Gamal, then it's formally sort of copying that pattern. So what I'm going to do is public is the setup. So I've got my ring, um, I've got some error distribution, and I'm going to pick also some moderately large integer k. Alice has a secret. And things that are small, I'm going to highlight in red so that you can keep track of them. And then Bob um, wants to send a message to Alice, and it's going to be some integer between 0 and Q over K, okay? And he has some random small, it's like an ephemeral key, R, here. And so Alice is going to um, create a public key, which is just a ring LWB sample, okay? So the secret is chosen small, the error is small. She sends this pair, this sample, over to Bob, and he uses the two parts of it, Alal Gamal to build the ciphertext. So here is a sample built on A, and here is the second part of a sample built on B, and he uses this one to mask the message. Okay, so he sends that back as the ciphertext, and then the decryption is to take W minus VS, and if you do that out, all the small stuff over here in red accumulates over here, and you're left with that masking the message. And at this point, the message can be found because what you do is you round to the nearest multiple of k, and this stuff will all go away because it's small. Okay. So that's the that's the idea. Um, of course, in the real world, you do a little bit more than this, but that gives the idea. Okay. Um, so now, in the title, there was ring learning with rounding as well. So this is also something that's been uh, hasn't been looked at as. Uh, as much. So ring learning with errors was sort of the main proposal. And now people are turning to um, removing the errors and replacing it with rounding. And the idea is that the errors um, are uh, they're requiring randomness in your crypto system. I mean, when I first learned about ring LWE, I, I sort of um, rebelled against this randomness being in my crypto system. And uh, but it's also costly for implementation because you have to be able to trust that randomness, right? Um, and so one way to make the randomness um, uh, deterministic is as follows. Okay, so first I'm going to define a function which gets you from Z mod Q to Z mod P with no particular requirement on the relation between uh, Q and P. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to round to the nearest thing on the clock. <laughs> okay, so uh, I mean, when I first saw this, I was like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> this is crazy. But um, but you can define such a thing. There's nothing wrong with the definition. Um, I've got my, you know, my mod eight clock out here and my mod five clock in here, and I'm just going to go to the nearest notch on the five clock instead of the eight clock. Okay. Um, and this is the kind of rounding that they do to the second part of the sample. And that rounding effect, that shift of the rounding is the new error, but now it's deterministic. So what you're going to do is you're going to take in the LWE case, right, you would have a dot product of A and S and you round it to P instead of Q, because it had entries in FQ before. Uh, and then that's what you give for the, um, <laughs> for the second part. So if you think of this as living in some um, continuous space, then the error is the difference between taking this mod Q and taking this mod P by this crazy function, okay? Or for ring learning with errors, what you do is for, your, for the second part is you take A times S, and then you take the coefficients in your basis, and each of them you round mod P instead of mod Q. 
Okay. So um, the reason I say it seems crazy, right, is because it's not respecting the ring structure. It's like, it depends on the basis. Um, it just seems a very ad hoc. Um, but maybe that's actually what's protective about this, right, is that you're doing something unexpected uh, and not related to the ring structure as strongly as you might uh, hope for. What's interesting is, um, so this is proposed to one of the NIST finalists, for example, but they're doing this from Q, a power of two to P, a, another power of two. So what they're doing here is they're dropping the um, least significant bits. So they're taking just the most significant bits to give you of the output vector in the second part of the sample. Um, okay, so this hasn't been looked at from a cryptanalysis perspective much at all, this rounding um, modification. Okay, so, um, so why do people want to use ring LWE, LWR? Um, so uh, of the seven finalists currently in the post-quantum crypto competition, three of them are based on module or ring LWE, LWR. It's very adaptable, as I pointed out. It's kind of similar to discrete log problem. Um, it's useful, for example, for homomorphic encryption. It's uh, more efficient and small to implement compared to LWE because the extra symmetries of the ring allow you to reduce your key sizes and um, computation time and stuff um, for implementations. And why do we think that it's at all a hard problem is because of security reductions. So the, the most famous one is that it's at least as hard, quantumly speaking, as solving the shortest vector problem for ideal lattices in the corresponding ring, okay? So to believe this is hard, you have to believe that ideal lattices are hard compared to general lattices, okay? So it is a different security assumption putting in the number theory. All right, so um, no matter what your point of view is on post-quantum cryptography, whether you think that we're duking it out for who gets to own the future here, lattices are isogenies, those are isogenies. Um, or whether you think we're collaborating again in this fight against the evil quantum computer or whatever, I claim that in any case, you should want to cryptanalyze ring learning with errors. Um, the reason is that it's a front runner. And if we want to trust the security, there's two ways to trust a cryptographic problem, right? There's security reductions to known problems, and there's just failing to cryptanalyze it, right? So whether you want it to win or lose, you should try to cryptanalyze it to be sure what the answer is, is this hard or not? And in particular, the security reductions um, shouldn't be everything. I claim we should cryptanalyze ring learning with errors directly. And the reason is that these, these security reductions, they're, quite, they're quite, quite complicated. So as you move from one problem to another, there's, I mean, first of all, there's a big parameter space, right? We've got our error distribution. If we're in the learning with errors situation, it could be any shape or size or whatever. We've got the dimension of the ring. We've got our choice of which number field we're working in. That's certainly quite a varied bag. Um, we've got um, the number of samples that you might have available when you're trying to attack the problem. And all of those things transform under these security reductions. So for example, if we're trying to reduce LWE to LWR, this rounding version, the reductions may change the dimension. The, um, the ratio between P and Q for which they work has some complicated relationship to the security parameter. Um, the number of samples that you have depends on, you know, there's very many different versions of the reductions, some of which sort of work for this part of the parameter space, some of them work for that. The point is that I think that's indicative that this problem really is fairly different than the underlying SVP or standard hard lattice problems. And so if you try to cryptanalyze it directly, you're really working on a different beast than you would be on the lattice, um, say, short spectrum problems. Okay. And so I think that that's part of uh, making sure as a community that, um, that this is a safe pro protocol for the future. Okay. So that's my soapbox. So, um, so let's talk about attacking ring learning with errors. So the rest of the talk, I'm just going to talk about ways to attack it and where the number theory is so that there's interesting things to grab onto in, in the ring version of this. Okay, so this is what a sample looks like, to remind you. Um, the Right now, all the security parameters are set based on reducing this to standard lattice problems um, as, as an attack. So you have what's called the primal lattice attack, which is to look for this S by uh, changing this into a bounded distance decoding problem. So basically you're looking for an X so that AX minus B, that's the E, 
is minimized is small, right? So that's looking for um, something in this lattice generated by A, which is close to B. So that's um, bounded distance decoding, but where uh, close to B means close to B mod Q. So this is really um, lattice also generated by Q. So you can rephrase that way, or you can look for a short vector in this um, sort of dual lattice here, the elements X, which take A into a multiple of Q. And then if you were to multiply your sample, the, your original sample by X, you would then um, eliminate the X A S part and you would be left with a small part here. So you could attack decision by looking at those results and seeing if the second part is small consistently or not. Okay. Um, there's Aurora Gi, which is an, a way of changing it into uh, polynomial equations and trying to solve those. And then there's Bloom Kalai Wasserman, which is a combinatorial um, approach. I've phrased all these in ring LW, but these uh, really just depend on linear algebra. These are all general and can be applied to LWE. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Bloom Kalai Wasserman later. Okay, so can so my question is: can the arithmetic structure of ring LWB be exploited to attack the problem? So as a break here in the middle of the talk, um, what arithmetic structure do you think we could attack? Now you have homework you can type in the chat. What kinds of things does number theory give you that you don't have in a general lattice? Just name things from number theory. <laughs> no takers? Yes, Galois. Yeah, absolutely, class groups. These are all your favorite things. Just type your favorite things into the chat. Except elliptic curves, I don't know how to. All right, well, so um, pretty much everything that you can think of is at least potentially going to be useful in this situation. So what I wanna do for the rest of the talk is I wanna give you three little case studies, which are basically um, uh, examples of using the number theoretical structure to attack the lattice problems. So the first isn't about ring LWB at all, um, but it's a beautiful story. Um, I'm not involved in this story. I'm just telling you about uh, some um, amazing work on the shortest vector problem in ideal lattices. So the question is, the shortest vector problem, can you, uh, can you attack it more easily using the number theory of an ideal lattice, which is to say an ideal in a number field under the Minkowski embedding, as opposed to just a general lattice in RN? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to do this in a series of problems. So the first problem that you might try uh, to answer is the closed principal multiple problem. So suppose I have an ideal, uh, and I want to find a nearby ideal, which is principal. So that means find a B, so that AB is principal, but where the norm of B is small, so I haven't changed the lattice too much somehow. Okay. Um, so how might one go about doing that? Well, this certainly seems like a question in the class group. So what you can do is think of the class group as being, so choose some basis, uh, some generators, I should say, for the class group. Basis isn't really the right word here. Um, some generators for the class group, and then the class group looks like a copy of z to the k modulo the relations, right? And so the relations form some sort of lattice. Those are the linear combinations of the generators, which are trivial in the class group. And if I do that, then this might be a kind of mysterious object. Like it can be kind of hard to figure out what the lambda looks like. But in the cyclotomics in particular, um, Stickelberger has a theorem which gives an explicit description of lambda if you choose a nice set of generators in terms of Galois conjugates of, a, of an ideal. So, um, so then you have this lattice, but you also have a good basis for it. And then Bias and Song in quantum polynomial time can, um, given an ideal, express it in terms of the basis. And then what you want is now a closest vector problem. So you want to find an element of lambda, some ideal, which some combination of the generators, which is pr um, principal, um, which is close to alpha inverse. Okay, and so it's a closest vector problem, but importantly, you have a good basis because in the cyclotomics, we understand the structure of the, the class group in this particular way. Okay, so that means that this problem, um, you know, really essentially uses the number theory um, of this particular lattice of relations. 
All right, so, so maybe we can solve that. All right, then um, given your principal ideal, now we've got a principal ideal instead of the ideal somebody handed us. Uh, can you find a generator of that? And it turns out this also uh, we can do in quantum polynomial time. So it's a version of the hidden subgroup problem. Uh, the core idea is to take this exact sequence that comes with a number field, right? So one piece of this is to take the, um, uh, an element in the number field and generate a principal ideal from that element. And the kernel of that map is the units. So if you use that in your hidden subgroup problem, you're sort of trying to get the units, many details lacking. Um, that doesn't get you a generator, but the units is what changes you from generator to generator, right? It's related. So basically, you do a trick, for those familiar um, with how you use the hidden subgroup problem to solve DLP, you know, originally it looks like the hidden subgroup problem works well for finding the order of an element, but then you change it to solving the DLP problem by adding an extra factor in there. It's a little bit of a trick. That same um, idea, in essence, will let you adapt this to find a generator. So again, many details missing but to give you at least what the um, players are. OK, and now we have a generator and a principal ideal. Can we find a short generator of our principal ideal? So that would be the short generator problem. And the answer, again, is yes. But here, the appropriate thing to do is to look at the unit lattice, because that's what moves you around from one generator to another in, in a principal ideal. So if we have a generator uh, G, and or sorry, we have a generator H, and we want to get to a generator G. In the, in the log embedding, this looks like log g is log h plus the log of some unit. And we want log g to be small. We want to find a small generator. So basically, we're looking for, we're given log h, and we want to get nearby element of the unit lattice. So it's, again, a closest vector problem. And again, in the cyclotomic case, we understand the units well enough to have a good basis and to be able to do this kind of, this kind of work. So um, the, the cyclotomic units. Um, generate most of the unit group for cyclotomic fields. And so we can also, so we can get at least to sub-exponential alpha in polynomial time um, for this problem. And so if we combine these three problems, then what you're doing is you're finding a sub-exponentially nearby principal ideal, finding a generator of that ideal, and then finding a short generator of that ideal. And you can do it in quantum polynomial time. So this graph that I had for SVP before is now chopped off somewhere here in the sub-exponential region for ideal lattices. So ideal lattices have something you can do, which it, it's clear can't be done in general to, to general lattices, which it is a, uh, you know, a real improvement in runtime. It doesn't affect the crypto region, um, but uh, but it's, um, I think, a lesson that ideal lattices really might be easier than general lattices. It's interesting because Wikipedia still says a minority of researchers believe ideal lattices are easier than general lattices. Um, uh, so if you're interested in this story, uh, there's a beautiful um, uh, expositional piece by Leo Duca, and um, this graph is essentially stolen from, from that. Okay. All right, so the second story. Um, this is ring LWE directly, but it's using, using much less number theory. So um, we don't see the class group or the ideal class or the uh, unit group, but, um, uh, but we do see the ring structure. So the question in this line of attack is to think about O mod Q as a ring. We have its Chinese remainder theorem decomposition here, depending on the splitting of Q. Um, and you could uh, project to any of those factors with a ring homomorphism. And so if you have a ring homomorphism as a map from this bigger space to the smaller space, samples will still have the form of a sample after the map. Okay, so if it looks like AS plus E, it still looks like AS plus E, but now reduced. So you might uh, now think, okay, so now I can try to solve the ring LWE problem on these reduced samples because they're living in this smaller space. And hopefully this is a much smaller space. So if it's small enough that you could just try guessing the secrets, then how would you know if you guessed correctly? Well, you're guessing, first of all, for S tilde, not for S, right? So you're only getting a piece of information about S by doing this. But suppose I picked a particular guess, then I could try plugging that in here and I could derive what the error is and see if it looks like an error. So basically, I could take B tilde minus 
A tilde times my guess, that would give me what should be E tilde. And over all the various samples that I have, I can sort of graph what that looks like. If I've guessed incorrectly, that should just be uniform in my small ring. But if I guessed correctly and these errors are still small under the reduction, then I would see that they're small and I would know that I had LW samples and I would solve the decision problem. Um, okay, so uh, the problem with this approach is that when I reduce, this error still has to be small. It has to be discernible. It has to be at least not uniform. So the error distribution under my homomorphism can't look uniform if I'm going to be able to distinguish between these things. And it turns out that the two power cyclotomic case, the one mostly proposed for applications because of um, the efficiency of all its symmetries, is actually protective in this case. The, um, the shape of that lattice means that when you go and try to do these particular homomorphisms as linear transformations, they just obliterate the error um, distribution and it looks uniform in the smaller ring. So it doesn't work. <laughs> um, but, and you can prove where uh, this might be safe, uh, you know, what sort of parameter what sort of parameters can be safe against this attack. But if you allow yourself to range through the various number fields, you really do see different things happening. And there are infinite families, even Galois fields, um, that are vulnerable to this. But of course, this depends a lot on exactly how you're setting things up. So you can use the Minkowski embedding, what error distribution, and so on. It's a huge parameter space. What this says is sort of proof of concept that certain parts of this parameter space really aren't safe. Um, and interestingly, uh, the ramified prime, when you have a prime cyclotomic field, it seems to be a problem. Okay, so that's, um, that's uh, case study number two. And the last one that I want to talk about is uh, bloom kalai wasserman So that's one of these um, general lattice attacks, which are used for setting parameters. It's combinatorial, and the drawback to it is that it needs a lot of samples. Now there's a way to generate new samples from old that are supposed to be sort of statistically a little bit different, um, but uh, but it's a it's a valid objection to any real world attack where your crypto system might only give a handful of samples. However, um, it's exponential and a lot of work has been done in, in the runtime of this against LWE. So what if we tried to use the ring structure? Um, what would happen? So let me give you the the key idea behind Bloom Kalai Wasserman. So uh, the idea is um, to take linear combinations of your samples so that the A ends up in a smaller subspace. So let's do as a baby example, suppose we're in FQ squared, we could look for collisions in the first entry so that when we take a difference of two things that were the same in the first entry, we're now in this subspace of co-dimension one. And then we could just take that linear combination of the two samples and it would still um, look like a sample, except that over here, the error is now a sum of two different errors. And so it's inflated somewhat, okay? So you can, if you can find these linear combinations, you can push your original ring LW problem into a smaller dimension, but at the cost of the error inflating a little bit, which makes it harder to solve the problem. So that's the core idea behind this algorithm. Um, so here, this says the same thing at the top of the slide. Um, and if you do this, then you actually, because you've gone down to this smaller part, you actually only get a piece of S. So I guess maybe the thing to do is to look here, right? This um, has a zero in the first entry. So the first coordinate of S now doesn't, uh, isn't carried into the new problem. So you solve for a little piece of S when you do this. Okay, so, the, so as a big scale overview of the problem, what you're doing is, you have um, sample reduction, which is finding these small linear combinations. That's exponential because it's basically just looking around for coincidences. And then hypothesis testing is finding the S once you're in a small enough situation. And then you have to back substitute to feed all that info on S back into the overall problem. That's exponential again. And then you repeat to get another chunk of S. So that's, that's the algorithm in a nutshell. So how could this get better if we're working against ring LWE instead of LWE? Well, it turns out that the structure of the ring um, gives you some sort of especially useful subspaces to look at. And what they are is, suppose just for the sake of argument here, that we're working in the case where it's a, um, 
where O mod Q is just a finite field, um, then there are subfields, right? And we could take a multiplicative coset of one of those subfields. And that's my subspace that I'm aiming at. So suppose I have a sample whose first entry is in that subspace. Then by taking the, um, the trace down from the big subspace to the smaller one, you can essentially preserve, even though trace isn't a homomorphism, you can essentially preserve the structure of the samples. So um, this, I'm just applying trace to this under the assumption that A can be written as A naught times something from the smaller subfield. And that something comes out through the trace and I multiply top and bottom like this. And then this um, version of the secret here depends on my choice A naught, but it's consistent across the samples. Um, okay, so that's, so you can do the same kind of thing, but you're respecting some of the ring structure when you do this. And that's what's uh, important. You have to ask how the um, error distribution transforms. Um, for reasons of time, I'll summarize this slide to just say it transforms well. The trace is actually um, uh, deletes some of the coefficients of your uh, error vector. And so it doesn't inflate too much. And so then the idea now would be to take A living in your multiplicative coset, reduce your samples, solve ring LWE there. And then your samples, instead of back substituting back up, you can just take your original samples and you can multiply them by um, by zeta, which is an L, you know, the, the root of unity, to get a new set of samples. And then when you reduce, you get a different part of the secret, just from the ring structure. So what happens is that the whole back substitution phase is gone. So that whole exponential piece is now gone. And in fact, uh, for not as exciting, but for, for implementations, the individual um, pieces of S that you're solving for, you could do them in parallel. OK. And so then the, the takeaway in that case is that um, uh, that you get some significant speed ups. It's still exponential, but it was exponential for two reasons before and now it's only exponential for one reason. Um, and uh, I, in my slides, I was using that the ring of integers here was fq to the k. But uh, with the Chinese remainder theorem, you can actually accomplish the same thing even if you're not in that case. It's just a little simpler to talk about in that case. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's a significant uh, change, at least in terms of like a a lesson learned uh, way, if not a practical application kind of way, I think. And so um, the ring structure can actually be used to cryptanalyze in this, in this context too. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, for this very nice talk. Um, are there any questions? You can either raise your hand by clicking on participants, or you can just write in the chat if you have a question. Maybe while people are thinking, I can ask a question. Um, so, I was wondering, seeing all of these, um, the, the big difference, as you pointed out, between the uh, between ideal SVP and and generic SVP, mm -hmm. um, is it actually possible to construct a crypto system which would reduce to, in terms of security, to an SVP and a generic lattice, or is that just impossible? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. So there was soliloquy, but that was ideal lattices. Um, and I don't know exactly the, uh, the details there. Yeah, I'm not, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I don't know of any. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's impossible to do it efficiently, but I wasn't sure if there was a sort of theoretical barrier as well. Yeah, no, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, maybe I can ask one more. So um, it, you gave you gave a few uh, examples of, of attacks, um, and I was the, there's obviously examples out there that, that are not broken. <laughs> How do they avoid these uh, these types of attacks? Well, so um, yeah, the 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 big picture is that none of these attacks really affect the suggested parameters that people are using. Um, 
for crypto systems, for example, for the NIST submissions and stuff. So the uh, the first attack on IDLS SVP just isn't strong enough. It doesn't get you a small enough vector. Um, the second one, um, you have to choose sort of strange parameters to get that attack to work. It just doesn't, right off the bat, doesn't work for cyclotomics. Um, and then the last one doesn't really succeed in lowering the runtime. It's just sort of a proof of concept in a way that it shows that you know you you can improve something, but you don't actually improve the uh, the bottom line, which is that it's exponential. Um, and do so, they, do they look like they can't be pushed any further? What's the what's the well? Yeah. So for that? the for the one with homomorphisms, you can basically prove that uh, certain parameters are immune to that. And so, um, and so now it just gives a bound, you know, gives a boundary on parameters. Don't don't use these crazy fields. Um, and so people just stick to that. Uh, so yeah, but for for the other cases, no. I mean, I I don't think there's any proof that ideal lattices couldn't be easy. Cool. You know, you can only prove that a certain type of attack can't work on certain parameters, right? But who knows what other things people might think of? So. Um, 